Welcome to Sandy Says. My name is Sandy Dematurgic, and I am the Sardis SA staff supporter, the resource and liaison for potential or current SA group leaders of our SA groups for people with schizophrenia related disorders. I also am a member of the SARDA Board of Directors. July is Minority Mental Health Month, so we will discuss the barriers minorities face receiving services for severe brain disorders. I have invited a two-part panel of people who have experience with psychosis. Today, we will talk to providers and researchers. According to Treatment Advocacy Central website, quote, Approximately 5.5 million have severe bipolar disorder, 2.2% of the population, 51% untreated. Approximately 2.8 million have schizophrenia, 1.1% of the population, 40% untreated. End quote. Brain disorders affect the communities in the United States of America from the TAC website. Quote. 169,000 homeless people with serious mental illness in 2015 by annual homeless assessment report. 383,000 inmates with mental illness in jails and prisons. 50% estimated percentage of people, of percentage of individuals with schizophrenia or bipolar who attempt suicide during their lifetime. 10% estimated percentage of homicides involving an offender with serious mental illness, 2014 homicide rates. 29% estimated percentage of family homicides associated with serious mental illness. 50% estimated percentage of mass killings associated with serious mental illness, close quote. According to CDC, suicide is the second leading cause of death for the general population aged 15 to 24. According to racial and ethnic disparities in mental health care, evidence and policy implications by Thomas McGuire and Jean Miranda in 2018, with the except quote, with the exception of Puerto Ricans, Research finds that minorities report rates of lifetime mental disorders less than white Americans, the black Americans, and Latinos, all quote, end quote. However, according to SAMHSA in the 2018 National Survey on Drug Use and Health African Americans, quote, um, among African Americans with a mental illness, two in nine, 22.4% or 1.1 million had a serious brain disorder yet under 50%, close quote, yet under 50% received treatment for both young adults in ages 26 to 49. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Statistics, let's look at minorities and suicide. Quote, in 2017, suicide was the second leading cause of death for African Americans aged 15 to 24. In 2018, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander adults had similar rates of mental illness as compared to non-Hispanic whites. However, in 2018, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders were significantly less likely to receive mental health services or to receive prescription medications. For American Indians, Alaskan Natives in 2017, suicide was the second leading cause of death between ages 10 to 34. For Asian Americans, suicide was the leading cause of death for ages 15 to 24 in 2017. For people who were Hispanics in 2017, suicide was the second leading cause of death for ages 13, 15 to 34, close quote. So based on the number of people committing suicide as the top or second leading cause of death for age 15 to 24, in my opinion, it appears that services are needed. Let's talk about barriers to care. I would like to introduce Dr. Raymond Cho, Board of Directors member, and Dr. William Lawson, Sort of diversity chair, who are both psychiatrists, 
and Dr. Marie Smith Eaves. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so again, and then I just really emphasize that even though uh, it's my training, I have exposed to the first patient population. Nevertheless, uh, because of what we had on um, that, that time, the three DSM-3 and later on DSM-4, um, misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed occurred and was contributed to many people of color ending up in the correctional system, which uh, has been shown by, um, by the study you just cited that um, the likelihood of getting treatment in the correctional system is much less um, than in the general population. And since then, as you know, with the institutionalization, one of the negative consequences of the institutionalization is that the um, largest mental health providers became the correctional system. And, and unfortunately, um, these are not areas, not only are they areas in which treatment is less likely, uh, state-of-the-art treatment is less likely, but also um, proper training by a psychiatrist who didn't necessarily have specific interest in forensic. He just did not get exposed to those settings or the kinds of issues that these patients face. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Lawson. Dr. Cho, did you have anything to add? Uh, I guess I might be able to share some thoughts just on... Uh... Uh, training aspect. Uh, so I went through med school and um, uh, residency almost uh, 20 years ago. Uh, graduated from my residency program right around then. And um, I think uh, at the time, I don't recall there being uh, that much diversity in the uh, the, my cohort or, or colleagues across the country um, that came from very diverse backgrounds. Um, although I think it was starting to maybe change a little bit, uh, but the overall direction since then, I think has been encouraging. Um, I think it was, it was notable perhaps compared to my uh, med school class, which was reasonably uh, diverse that same kind of diversity wasn't reflected in uh, my psychiatry colleagues, both in training and then after in, in practice. Um, I think historically, if there were some diversity, uh, it would often be, and unfortunately, in terms of um, foreign medical grads would often come to, I was trained in Canada and US, so to North America, and psychiatry was seen as, uh, and it probably was, one of the, the easier specialties to, to get uh, trained and, and credentialed in. Um, so it wasn't that uh, the docs necessarily had a passion for mental health to begin with and, and pursued that as their primary focus. It was more out of, that, that was the option that was there. Um, I think as time has evolved, uh, I've been encouraged by, um, I think there's been a movement uh, and trend towards psychiatry becoming overall attractive as a, as a specialty for medical professionals. Um, and alongside that, um, a more diverse uh, background uh, physician pool going into psychiatry, not because they kind of had to or it's easy, but because um, you know, there's actual inspiration to work in the mental health uh, space. So um, I, I, I mean, this uh, is largely anecdotal, just uh, observations on my own part. And I don't know if Dr. Lawson uh, has sort of similar observations or maybe even has some numbers to, to back some of these things up, but um, I, I think we're a far cry from seeing uh, the backgrounds of mental health uh, care professionals being representing uh, the, the diversity of the populations being served in a commensurate way, like in a proportional way. But I think the overall trend is encouraging. Well, that's great. That's very good to hear. Um, okay, so. And that is definitely the case. This mentioned several factors. One is um, psychiatry has, become, has a knowledge base on um, advances in uh, neuroscience, psychopharmacology, and so forth. 
have now made it uh, uh, comparable uh, to other kinds of specialists. To compensation, a psychiatrist is substantially uh, improved um, mm -hmm. so that it is, um, it is one of the better paying uh, specialties. The three mm -hmm. lifestyle, and the lifestyle of psychiatrists is uh, a system that can live a comfortable life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank y'all. And going on, um, Dr. Cho, you conducted research on neurostimulation therapeutics at Baylor and the VA, which I understand is for <clears throat> is for primarily people with a depression. Are there other diagnoses it helps with? And since we are discussing the incidence of suicide as symptom in many psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, does it help decrease suicidal thought for those diagnosed or only depression? And do you find many minority groups using this form of treatment? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the research that I conducted at VA and Baylor uh, involved um, something called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS. And that's actually been used across um, many diagnostic domains, uh, including schizophrenia, depression, uh, PTSD, mild cognitive impairment, uh, anxiety disorders. It, it really uh, has the potential to be beneficial to many different types of symptoms for many different types of disorders. Um, my particular research was actually looking at uh, the potential impact on uh, negative symptoms and cognitive impairments in schizophrenia, which, um, as you know, can be very uh, debilitating uh, functionally for patients with schizophrenia. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the data seemed to indicate that it was actually having a positive effect, um, and many other studies actually seem to corroborate that. Uh, so it wasn't specifically tailored to uh, suicidality or depression in the context of psychosis, but um, that the target actually was very, uh, it was the same target um, as is used for the treatment of depression, uh, which as you know is often, uh, if very severe, it can be associated with uh, suicidality. Um, so yes, it has application to schizophrenia, not um, specifically geared towards suicidality, uh, but towards negative symptoms and cognitive impairments. Um, another neurostimulation modality, though, that is actually uh, already in clinical use for depression is uh, something that's called TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, and the FDA-approved indications are for depression and for OCD. Uh, and even TMS, though, can also have benefits for uh, other uh, disorders, including schizophrenia. And with psychosis, it's primarily been investigated for, again, negative symptoms, which it's been shown to have some uh, uh, decent efficacy for as well as uh, auditory hallucinations. Um, speaking to suicidality specifically, though, uh, I'm not aware of any studies applying TDCS for suicidality, but for um, uh, TMS and suicidality, there is uh, very good evidence, obviously, for depression, but yeah, also decent evidence that for uh, suicide, um, risk prevention, uh, that it can be very effective. As far as uh, um, sorry, there's a little bit of a ruckus here, just trying to get the environment quiet. Uh, as far as uh, uh, minorities, people of cover, color, uh, having access to these kind of treatment modalities. Um, my, my sense is that there really isn't uh, enough exposure of these treatment options. Um, I think 
historically there has already been a kind of a reluctance and level of maybe mistrust or at least lack of trust of the mental health system and TMS and TDCS and other stimulation modalities are already seen by the general public by and large as a, a kind of a esoteric uh, kind of fringe kind of treatment that's changing. People are becoming to um, coming to uh, become more educated and interested and open to stimulation, neurostimulation as a therapeutic option. Uh, but that's still a very much a work in progress. I would say um, probably uh, minorities in the way that just overall access to care and, and trust of the mental health uh, care system, um, that, that kind of level of uh, reluctance and, and mistrust may also apply even more to things like uh, TMS and other stimulation modalities. So I, I think we have uh, still a lot of work cut out for us in disseminating information about these kind of treatment options, um, educating the public, and, uh, and, and reassuring them that these are not just safe options, but really good and effective options for those that have tried multiple medications and, and uh, not been successful at addressing their symptoms. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, Dr. Lawson, you received the American Academy of Clinical Psychiatrists 2017 George Winokur Research Award for finding results of racial disparity of prescribing antipsychotics between black people and white people. Could you talk a little about this research? What about the claim that African Americans are overdiagnosed with schizophrenia when they actually have depression according to a Rutgers study? According and also, to, yes? And also some of research of our own as well. Um, that there's a tendency to overdiagnose um, schizophrenia when in fact, um, it used to be bipolar disorder. We also found out it's post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, in a major study, we found that even when you use um, very careful diagnostic um, techniques, uh, including uh, having um, um, independent evaluators, we still found um, overdiagnosis. And um, I respect that probably as something as the impact on treatment. And this, uh, what drove our study was a recognition that this, uh, uh, that again, as far as the previous uh, speaker, that African Americans are less likely to get newer and perhaps more effective treatments. What we're finding is that the older antipsychotics, for instance, are much more likely to cause problems like movement disorder, tardis, uh, it seems to be more common in African Americans. Uh, new agents um, creating the um, Bollock syndrome um, that Dr. David Henderson and others have shown um, may be more common in African Americans. So it's very important to see what we can do to improve access to new treatments. What our study showed is that um, with a new long, uh, new uh, long acting antipsychotics um, that uh, um, uh, 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 is a newer generation which actually tend to have um, less metabolic syndrome and, for, and less um, movement disorders that, again, we're finding African Americans don't have as much access um, to these agents. A lot of reasons for that has to do, part of it um, has to do with where folks get their treatment. Again, um, we get treatment in, in public facilities and the correctional system, we simply want to get the newest and the best treatment. And the other is a uh, general um, suspiciousness by many in the community um, in terms of trying novel treatments um, just because of um, previous um, inappropriate research that was done in Africa. So, the, uh, so, there, uh, so we find, and others have found, that despite efforts to improve medications, to have medications that are less affected by the P450 systems, so we had less racial disparities in terms of effects of these uh, medications. Despite the attempt to try to include more African Americans in clinical trials, um, we're still finding that um, even with these newer treatments, African Americans are 
beginning and some more meditations. Okay. And um, according to a presentation you gave recently, you found that African Americans with schizophrenia are less likely to be treated, more likely to be incarcerated, and be at great risk for being shot by the police. Uh, you also found repeatedly that African Americans are less violent than their Caucasian counterparts on an inpatient unit than on an article that you wrote with Yasavage, J.A. and Warner, P.D., Race, Violence, and Psychopathology in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. Yeah, that was actually one of the first papers of the Journal of Psychiatry. Um, we were um, basically we were looking at um, whether or not um, medicate there were uh, what kind of demographics and biological factors affected uh, treatment with uh, different psychotropic agents, and um, we we're looking at a variety of factors and didn't find much difference. And I said, well, let's look at race. I looked at race and found big differences in terms of whether or not folks were likely to get more medications. To put in seclusion and restraints, um, uh, and uh, to be violent. We found basically that African Americans were less violent in patient settings. Interestingly enough, but when we asked the staff and asked that some of the other factors, they simply refused to believe it. In fact, when I uh, place that I submitted a paper, came back and said, um, "No, that's that's that cannot be true. Uh, it's just it has since been replicated." And unfortunately, what we're seeing now is a strong belief that African Americans are intrinsically um, more um, violent um, when, in fact, they are. There's an excellent book, Protest Psychosis, uh, uh, that shows the uh, same point. And that is that historically, um, we looked at people with schizophrenia, mostly pleasant white people who didn't do much of anything in terms of assertiveness. And then um, the message changed in the uh, 60s and 70s um, that um, people with schizophrenia were violent. Uh, we still uh, have cases in which um, if, um, um, mass murders or some of these other crimes occur that the explanation seemed to be, well, the person is mentally ill and by implication the person is schizophrenic. And most importantly, it assumed that the person is a person of color. Um, this has led to, in some instances, this case, I was in one city that raised that issue, um, that when we um, when we, uh, we found that um, there were multiple cases, this was in Texas, of patients who were non-violent or perceived as police to be violent and were killed. Um, she didn't have schizophrenia, but the case of Sandra Bland, Land kids was one instance of just a lady um, who had a mental disorder with a correctional system um, and ended up um, um, in the life. Um, that led to some improvement in terms of legislation, in terms of how to deal with it. But the um, problem still exists. I have one unfortunate case in which I had a teenager who was running around the street naked, police shot and killed him, saying that he was felt for his life, even with a person passing on. Um, so again, there's a perception that mentally ill people, severe mentally illness, are somehow dangerous and violent, even, if, even by the very fact that they're being severely mentally ill. And then the other point is that they're a person of color that is seen as definitely an important threat. And unfortunately, the response is um, to uh, use um, lethal force in terms of trying to uh, either apprehend or uh, subdue these individuals. Yeah, that's troubling. Okay. And Dr. M M Marie Smith East, you are a traditional doctoral level minority fellowship program MFP fellow with the American Nursing Association. You are a nurse researcher, assistant professor, and psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner whose research focuses on access to care for individuals with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. You examine methods to increase access 
to mental health services and improved care for individuals. Do you also look at disparities in care for minorities with schizophrenia spectrum? And what do you think are some barriers to care and why? Um, just listening to um, Dr. Cho and Dr. Lawson, I'm, I also mimic exactly what they are talking about in terms of it, it's very historical um, that has gotten us to this point. Um, I think Dr. Lawson actually mentioned that the, the name of the book, The Protest Psychosis, it's by Jonathan Metzl. It talks about how um, over, over the history of just even the book that we use to diagnose patients, this is a DSM-5, um, the, the characteristics that they use to diagnose the patients with schizophrenia just changed over time. So yeah, it went from, oh, you know, it's it, it, oh, uh, literally aggression was kind of included in that uh, diagnosis. And so even now that, that people with um, African Americans or just minorities, um, Latinos, Hispanics, they tend to be disproportionately um, diagnosed with um, schizophrenia compared to others. But my research in particular uses geographic information systems um, to look at factors that contribute to access to care. So um, pretty much where you live matters. So we tell patients, you know, oh, you need to go out and exercise or gain weight from these medications. But we're not taking a look at their environment. Are there green spaces? Are there places for them to, you know, walk? Um, to even get that exercise. Then, of course, we look at the issue of insurance. Um, even with the Affordable Care Act, and even now with the 2016 Cures Act, and um, money is being poured into trying to increase um, patients being able to have access by means of insurance and so forth, we're still finding that there are still unmet treatment needs. So, ideally, my research looks at various different factors that can contribute to patients not having access to care. And absolutely, um, there is stigma, that's a barrier, um, cultural factors, um, whether or not the um, patient has, um, is in an area that's geographically isolated from adequate healthcare services. Um, I would say even just in general, just support, um, if they have any social support, I think even with my interest in schizophrenia um, really came from that aspect as well, just working with minority populations and them not having access to certain medications because it's community mental health versus if it were like in a different um, system that has access to those newer medications. Um, and that, that answers your question. But and I mean, even just within um, patients that are um, Latino or Hispanic, there's language barriers as well. Um, and I would say even with the diagnosis itself, there, there can be some, um, it's trying to decide whether um, so some of the perse um, persecutions that they might have in regards to um, uh, that are religious in nature, um, based on the culture, um, you know, I've had families that'll say, well, we can just pray away, you know, um, the spirits that are troubling them. Um, so it's also thinking about how culture, culture can impact the underutilization of even seeking treatment to begin with. So there's just many different factors that can contribute to whether or not someone um, gets care and just thinking of how we can connect them to services. Okay, great. So um, how do all three of you think reclassification of schizophrenia will help remove the barriers? And well, I just saw, I think we got free time, unlimited time, so. <laughs> well, I, um, I've always been impressed at how uh, folks with um, various neurological disorders, seizure disorders, um, 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 developmental disorders, seem to uh, treat um, different, um, often taking um, other the mental health system and show similar kinds of behaviors. And, Assumptions are not being made that their behavior is somehow tied into um, uh, racist and other kinds of beliefs. Um, the, and I think that if we do um, show that schizophrenia and other disorders are not a result of pathological murders, uh, not as one um, first result demon possession, or uh, even in psychiatry, though, it's felt. That, um, this, um, that African Americans somehow um, had um, 
inadequately above some egos and egos, and that's what contributes to their um, behavior. And if we get away from those uh, sciences, um, they'll be less likely to start adding these additional kinds of considerations that have to enhance the lack of folks and the prior to treat. Yeah, that's true. Anybody else? Um, I had a few thoughts about this. I, I think uh, uh, reclassifying schizophrenia as a, a brain disorder, a neurological disorder, uh, I think it could have really profound effects. Um, one is just a, a general effect um, for the whole population, for um, patients who might be seeking care, families helping those patients to seek care but also uh, to, to lawmakers, to insurance companies, um, and other stakeholders. Uh, conceptualizing psychosis as a kind of set of symptoms, as you might think what might uh, arise from having uncontrolled diabetes, um, and, and thinking in terms of a, a medical framework, I think it go a large distance to destigmatizing the illness and um, not just um, having others stigmatize the, the patients, but uh, including the patients self-stigmatizing and um, being reluctant to, uh, to seek uh, appropriate care. Uh, in that sense, it doesn't have anything to do with um, minorities or people of color per se. That's more of a, a rising tide lifts all boats. But as far as um, uh, minorities, uh, as was alluded to, how you might conceptualize the symptoms of psychosis, um, that there's some sort of vexing problems there that don't exist uh, in the case of things like diabetes or hypertension. Uh, no one thinks that it's actually uh, no one mistakes a person with diabetes for potentially being possessed by the devil in the way that someone with religious delusions might be interpreted as such in a, in a certain uh, context or framework. Um, actually, that brings to mind the example of uh, uh, epilepsy, which is now very widely accepted. I mean, I don't think there are exceptions um, as being a neurologic disorder, but historically, um, at certain times, certain cultures was interpreted as being possessed by a demon. Um, it's a little bit trickier with psychosis because uh, it's a very um, sort of abstract, higher cognitive ability that humans possess that is affected in the illness. And, and sort of it, uh, the illness strikes at the very core of what we think some of the key, key ingredients that makes us human, what we believe about the world, what we're sensing, the, what we can see and hear um, that is being affected, uh, you know, in the case of hallucinations. So um, there it gets really tricky. And uh, there's a general, I think, education that needs to be done that. Um, just in the way you might take uh, a blood sugar to assess um, for diabetes or an EEG to assess for epilepsy, the readout for, uh, for psychosis is these higher cognitive functions. So how people form beliefs about their environment, what they think they're hearing or seeing. Um, and that, that gets really, that, that, that's, that's a much, uh, more complicated not to untie than, you know, just giving a, a blood glucose test or, or doing an EEG. Um, and it gets perhaps even more complicated when you think about people of different cultural backgrounds, um, how things might be interpreted in, in certain contexts and backgrounds um, may, may be different. Uh, so even if one accepts that it is a brain disorder, how those symptoms may manifest and be distinguished from um, normal cultural uh, beliefs and interpretations uh, necessarily vary with the, the different uh, cultures. So um, 
I think reclassification could go a far ways to reducing stigma and self-stigma. But alongside that, if it's going to um, also further help uh, minorities, I think there has to be some extra thought and, and education concerning how exactly the different symptoms of psychosis may manifest and be teased apart from, uh, from sort of the, the cultural norms uh, of the people from the, the various uh, different backgrounds. Okay. Mm -hmm. I um, also echo those sentiments as well. I think it's definitely a start um, mm -hmm. and possibly just increasing the amount of um, research that can be, or even the targeted research in regards to um, schizophrenia, um, when you think of it in that regard. I know that genetics is a big thing these days, um, and but just not enough um, that's specific because it's kind of like they brush off, oh, it's just a behavioral illness or you know, mental health illness, it's not, you know, it's not a brain illness. So um, I think it's definitely a start for openness and a start for um, future research. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming here today and talking to me about this. And have a great evening. <laughs>